We're going to move on to another topic now with uh, Dr. Perry Chalkitis. Uh, he is the uh, he has a PhD. He's a dean and professor of biostatistics and social and behavioral health sciences at the School of Public Health at Rutgers University. He is also a faculty member of the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Dr. Chalkitis' program of research examines inter uh, intersection between HIV epidemic, drug abuse, and mental health burden and biological, behavioral, psychosocial, and structural factors that are predisposed these overlapping epidemics. He's written many books. His last book, The Age Generation, Stories of Survival and Resilience, is a 2014 Lambda Literary Award nominee and recipient of the American Psychological Association Distinguished Book Awards in the LGBT psychology. Dr. Kankitis, your studies have shown, thank you for joining us, by the way. Uh, your studies have shown that social ecological framework indicates that individual health and health behaviors are influenced by factors that function under multiple levels of their environments. Can you share some knowledge with us and our audience from your, all your research on the GBM community? There we go. Can you hear me? Okay, so first of all, thank you for having me here and for this opportunity to have a conversation with my colleagues. Um, I want to say that first and foremost, I think this conversation about men's health exists not in opposition to conversations about women's health, but as a complement to conversation about women's health, and that holistically, we're dealing with a population of people. Um, Number two, I think that uh, one other point I'd like to make before I dive into your question specifically is that and when we talk about men, we're treating them as if they're a monolith. Men are not monolithic. Men come in all shapes and sizes. There are heterosexual men. There are gay men. There are bisexual men. There are genderqueer men. There are transgender men. And these men have very different health needs and health manifestations that I think we have to think about in addressing the health needs of the population at large. So what the challenges are for one segment of the population are not necessarily the challenges that they are for the other segment of the population. For the last 20 years, my work has focused primarily on the health of uh, gay and bisexual men. And at the beginning of my career, my focus was on the HIV epidemic because that was what was devastating the community in the 1980s and 1990s. I would think you'd be short-sighted in 2017 to say that HIV defines the, tot the totality of gay men's health, but it is still part of gay men's health. In the United States, gay men are 3 to 5 percent of the population, yet 60 percent of people living with, H with, with, with HIV or AIDS, 60 percent of new infections. That's what we call in public health a health disparity. If you're an African-American or Hispanic gay or bisexual man, your rates are exponentially higher. Why do I point this HIV example out in particular? And I want to talk about some other examples of, of, of these issues. It's to get to Yana's point, which is the following. People don't wake up one day and decide they're going to do bad behavior. They don't decide they're going to be obese or they're going to smoke or they're going to become addicted to meth. They are driven to these conditions by social inequities in society. And when we think about the gay and bisexual population, and we think about communities of color in our country, these are the communities that experience racism, discrimination, marginalization at higher rates, which consistently in the literature has been shown to be associated with poorer health outcomes. Minority stress theory, theory which is one of the theories that I, we espouse in our own work, which is a theory that's, uh, that's been uh, um, described very fully by a, a fellow psychologist named Elon Meyer, argues that individuals who are members of minority groups experience stressors. So the more minority memberships you have, the more stressors you experience. So if we think about this from an HIV perspective, and we think about why in the United States do white gay men experience HIV less radically than black gay men, it is because White gay men are marginalized because of their sexual identity. Black gay men are marginalized because of their sexual identity and because of their race. And so minority stress theory is one way of sort of conceptualizing the role that social inequities play in driving disease. Another theory that I, I personally love and has directed our own work at my center for the last 20 years is syndemic theory. And it's been alluded to here. Health problems don't exist in isolation. Where you see mental health issues, you see substance use. Where you see substance use, you see obesity. Where you see obesity, you see cardiovascular disease. And in the literature, this has been defined as a syndemic. And study after study after study after study has shown consistently that populations that experience marginalization and psychosocial burdens at higher rates not only have a higher rate of syndemic, and these 
but these health conditions fuel and exponentially make each other worse. And I think this is sort of the perspective that we saw, besides the biomedical perspective that my colleagues have done a beautiful job ex uh, expressing, to, to, to think about the health of, of, of men in general. I want to just say a couple more things related to some of the issues that came out up today. Um, the issue of hot masculinity that often defines the lives of, of men is probably best understood as hypermasculinity. Masculine conceptions are completely a natural thing for men to experience. Hypermasculine perceptions, having a body of a certain type, acting in a sexual way, being aggressive, those, those conceptions of masculinity are the ones that deteriorate health. So when we think about the lives of gay and bisexual men in the United States, I want us to, to expand our, our thinking and to think about the lives of gay and bisexual men in the world. We have to expand our thinking beyond just HIV. Gay and bisexual men experience heart disease at higher rates than, than straight men do. Gay and bisexual men have experience HPV, and I'll get to this point in a second, and the manifestations of HPV at higher rates. They experience depression and suicide and substance use and anorexia and body dysmorphia at higher rates than their heterosexual counterparts. Why is that? Because of the social conditions that gay and bisexual men are raised in. Look, we think that in the United States everything is wonderful in 2017 if you're a gay man. It's hardly the truth. A young person who's struggling with their sexuality and trying to find their place in the world turns on the TVs and hears tirades all the time about what it means to be a member of a sexual minority. I want to just highlight one more point um, here, which is the HPV point, because I think it's not come up at all. We know anal cancer is not very common in the population. It is two per 100,000 is the rate of anal cancer. In fact, nobody had heard of anal cancer, probably. Most people in this room and most people in this country had not heard of anal cancer until Farrah Fawcett became diagnosed and eventually died. If you are a gay man and you are an HIV negative, time, negative gay man, you are 40 times more likely to have anal cancer. You are 80 times more likely to have anal cancer if you are an HIV positive gay man. So this is another, manifesta this is another manifestation of a health disparity that is very particular to a population. And you know, we talked about pap smears here you know, a, little, a little while ago. Gay men have pap smears too. And so, so if you are a gay man listening to this and you have anal intercourse and you are not vaccinated for HPV, please go have a pap smear because you can prevent this cancer from inf affecting your life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Halkitis, what, are some, what type of a message would you like to give our audience uh, uh, based on some risk factors and, and some prevention um, that men can actually be more aware of? What, what, is, what is your checklist? Yeah so, I, yeah, so I would say, you know, the challenge for, yeah, I think that, look, I feel like the challenge for men in general is, you know, engagement with care. And, and hypermasculine conceptions are definitely interf interfere with that. I think, in fact, probably gay men are better uh, are better at connecting with with care than heterosexual men, just because the population has been forced to because of the HIV epidemic, right? But still, I think I point the I th I'm going to point it outward and say the following. I think it's not about the person necessarily, but we have to think about as a society how do we deliver care to men in a way that's accessible to them. Men in our studies have consistently told us that when they have the sniffles, they go to one doctor, and when they have a discharge from their penis, they go to another doctor. Why is that? They feel judged about their behavior. And so I'm challenging all of us who provide, you know, who, provide, who do research and provide service to the population of men to think about providing service in a way that is uh, non-judgmental and encompassing. And quite frankly, you know, one, if we can get men to do one checkup once a year, that would be a step in the right direction. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you so much.